Hey guys, so many of you have been asking me how on earth I managed to score 90% in my chemistry A level. Now, to be honest, this isn't actually that unusual because most exam boards tend to, tend to set their chemistry grade boundaries quite high compared to other subjects. So the majority of students who scored A stars in their chemistry A levels would have got nearly 90%. And hopefully, if you're willing to put your head down and do the hard work, then the following tips I give you will help you to be one of those students when you sit your exams later on in the summer. So tip number one, use the textbooks. Now, this may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised at the number of students who've, ne who've never even seen the textbook for their specification. And in fact, I was actually one of those students during the first month of my A-level. As it happened, my brother had just done chemistry with the same exam board, so I was supposed to just use his copy. And when I finally went and asked him where it is, he was like, so what have you been doing for a whole month without the textbook? Now I did OCRA, so I used this one. If you're doing AQA, you'll need this one. Um, if you're doing Edexcel, you need this one, and so on. If you just go on your exam board website, you can find the textbook for your specification, or just go on Google and type in your exam board name followed by chemistry A-level textbook. Now, a lot of teachers tend to think that the notes you take from their class should be sufficient for you. And sometimes this could be true, but you're not always going to be able to rely on what you take from your teachers. Sometimes you'll need to refer back to the textbook. And maybe sometimes you might want to check in the textbook to see whether what your teachers are teaching you is actually accurate. So believe me, guys, just get the textbook. It'll be your best friend. Many people say that textbooks are too expensive, and to be fair, that's probably true. Nowadays, you know, the textbook could cost up to £50 to buy new. But even then, if you think about it, £50 over the whole two years of your A-level, um, which could be the difference between an A or a B and an A-star, I think it's still, it's still worth that investment. If you really can't afford that, at least see if you can find a copy in the library which you could use. Which brings me on to tip number two. Great, so now you've got the textbook, when are you going to use it? You are going to use it when you go home after school and spend some time studying by yourself. It really surprised me the number of students who couldn't understand why they weren't doing well simply by attending all their lessons and not doing anything beyond that. Now I'm not saying miss your lessons, by all means go to all your lessons, get 100% attendance, but attending school five days a week period one to five isn't going to be enough to get you an A-star. You're going to have to put in some of your own um, self-study, which goes beyond the hours you put in at school. Now go ahead and look at any research conducted, any surveys conducted, even ask around in your own, your own class. You'll always find that the top students are the ones who spend that time doing independent study. Which leads me on to my next tip, which is to have a schedule. Now, of course, the lessons you attend in school will already um, be all written out on a timetable. But even the time you spend outside of school studying should be um, scheduled or should have some sort of structure. Because remember, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now, successful people always start early. So in an ideal world, you'll want to be waking up at around 5 or 6 and sleeping at maybe around 11 and getting your self-study done early in the morning before going to school so that when you come back after school you can do something maybe a bit more relaxing but some schedule is still better than no schedule so even if you are one of those people who likes to stay up late um, you're still better off writing on your timetable that okay sleep at whatever one o'clock and wake up at eight and scheduling in your independent study so when we say independent study what are we actually going to spend our time doing and that brings me to my next tip, which is to actively recall material. Now, especially in a subject like chemistry, where you have to learn so many different equations, this is absolutely one of the best methods to use. Research has been done into this, and basically one of the best ways of moving something from your short-term memory to your long-term memory is to actively recall it. Also, the brain absorbs information a lot better if it's exposed to it over an extended period of time rather than all in one go. So let's take the alkylation of benzene for example. Look at the material and you practice writing it out, writing out all the, all the steps in the equation until you can write it out without looking. Keep on looking at, looking at the material until 
you can absolutely close the book, um, the textbook or your notes or whatever it is, um, and just write it out straight from your memory. And then you'd come back after, say, half an hour and you'd practice actively recalling that from your memory again without without looking at all. Then you'd come back again after, say, uh, one hour and again, straight from your memory, you have to write that out. And then uh, again, maybe after two hours or something, you get the point. Basically, the frequency you're required to keep coming back to um, recalling that will keep on reducing until you've got that absolutely cemented in your brain. Now, for me personally, this technique of actively, re actively recalling the stuff I learned in a spaced out manner was one I used to the full. As I mentioned before, it comes, it comes in useful particularly for the organic chemistry section where there's so many different multi-step reactions that you have to um, learn re learn to a very good to a very good standard. So what I did was I just got a big whiteboard and put it on my desk. So basically, my my desktop was a whiteboard, um, and every time I'd uh, need to learn a new a new chemical reaction, I would write out all the steps on on that whiteboard and then just rub it out and write it out again and rub it out and write it out again and keep doing that, writing it out from my memory without looking at the content. So the first time, obviously, I need to look at the content and try and learn that properly. But then I just keep on just just keep on writing it out on my whiteboard and rubbing it, rubbing it out like that. You can do that or you can do it on a whiteboard or you can use um, note paper, but then obviously you'd, you'd be throwing a lot of a lot of paper away. So just in that sense, having a whiteboard was nice. And I just did that with absolutely all the reactions in the organic section until I'd mastered them all. So everything even remotely benzene related was completely stuck in my head. And this must have been useful because in paper two, which is the organic chemistry paper, I actually scored 98%. Um, so in the entire paper, I only lost two marks. So tip number five, determination. It's all about your attitude. You have to be determined to get that high mark and don't let a low test score put you off. So I remember in, first year when we had an organic chemistry test coming up I prepared for that really hard and when it finally came I was like right today's the day I'm going to score a hundred percent after I sat my test I wasn't really feeling the same way because I knew that okay I made a few mistakes but I was still hoping okay maybe you know 90 91 92 something like that um, but when the actual test mark came I had scored only 72 percent which was a C so I was really, really disappointed with this, but at the same time, I more or less didn't let this be put me off getting the grade I wanted to get. I still thought I can get that, that A star. So 14 months later, when I was sitting the actual A-level organic chemistry paper, um, I scored 98% on that. Now that isn't to say that low scores shouldn't bother you. Of course they should, but what you need to take from that is that to get the grade that I'm capable of getting, I need to work harder rather than I'm not capable of getting that grade. Um, or it could be a case of maybe I need to work smarter. So maybe you're working two hours straight to try and learn some reaction processes. And it could be that instead of that, you need to maybe spend um, four, half, four half an hour sessions split um, over a longer period of time so that your brain can absorb that information better. There could be a lot of different factors, but basically at the end of the day, it just means that you need to improve on something rather than um, you can't do it. And it's the same case when it comes to criticism from teachers. Just because the teacher says you're going to get a C, don't let that put you off. You can still get an A star, but at the same time, don't just think, OK, I'm just going to ignore this person because they don't know what they're talking about either. Um, there must be a reason why they're criticizing you. So you just need to identify that problem and work on it. In summary, what you have to believe with absolute certainty is that both low test scores and criticism from teachers just mean one thing. You need to improve on something to get the grade you're capable of getting, not that you aren't capable of getting that grade. Tip number six is that you take agency over your own learning. So speaking of teachers, sometimes the teachers will set you things which aren't necessarily going to be the most useful things for you to do. So really, at the end of the day, it's down to you. For example, in some schools, they have study packs where they uh, you go through the study packs and you fill in definitions from the textbook. For some people, this is useful. For some people, this wouldn't be so useful. Really, at the end of the day, it's down to you to realize what is the most useful thing for you to do. Don't just 
blindly follow what the teacher advises you to do. You need to think about it for yourself and decide for yourself what is the best thing I can do in this moment of time which will get me, uh, which will increase my, which will increase my chance of getting more marks and get me that top grade which I want to get. So tip number seven is about using the past papers and their mark schemes. To succeed in any exam you need to do practice questions, practice questions and more practice questions. When it comes to the actual past papers, sometimes it might not be enough for your spec. So for example, I did uh, OCRA in 2019 and we just had 2016, 2017 and 2018, three years worth of, of past paper questions. Do other past paper questions from other exam boards for the parts you're, you, you've studied. So for example, you might um, be practicing physical chemistry. So find all the physical chemistry questions from other exam boards and, and do all of those. Um, the actual past papers from your spec, you might want to save them, or well not, you might want to, you should save them um, for the last, um, last the last couple of months in the run up to your, to your actual final A-level exam. When you do do them, um, it goes without saying that obviously you should mark them after you do them, but apart from just marking them, you should actually look at the uh, look at the mark scheme so that you can get some idea of what what the what your exam board are expecting from you. What sort of things they give marks for? So, for example, the six markers they tend to always have a similar structure, even though of course the content of the actual question will vary. So, if you just look at the um, mark scheme for a six mark question um, and you look down down the mark scheme and see what all the different six marks are given for. It'll give you some idea of what kind of an answer you need to give and how you need to set out your answer when you're actually answering a six marker in your um, A-level exam. Tip number eight is about exam technique. Again, of course, this is quite an obvious one. The better your exam technique is, the better your preparation for um, or the better your performance will be in the actual exam. Now, there's quite a lot of material out there regarding exam techniques, so I'm not really going to go that much into it. It's just basic things like on each question you're doing, checking the number of marks allocated for that question um, and then giving um, that, that many points. So for example, if it's, if it's a three mark question, you'll want to make sure that you've, you've written out three different things which should each get their own individual mark. And then of course there's RTFQ, read the full question. Tip number nine is to go through the specification. So particularly in the last month or two leading up to your exam, you want to make sure that you go through the specification to just be sure that you know everything that's on there. Because the reality is that in the actual exam, it's not like they can just pull something out of thin air and examine you on it. Every single thing that they can possibly examine you on is already written out in the specification. So do make sure to go through that, um, ticking things off and just making sure that you absolutely know every single thing on there inside out. And guys, those are my top nine tips for smashing your chemistry A-level. I'm sure you're all capable of doing it. Just make sure you put in that hard work and you'll definitely get what you deserve. Thanks for watching. Please make sure to like, share and subscribe as I'll be uploading some other exam content as well. And I'd like to wish you the very best of luck with your chemistry A-level and of course all your other A-levels when you sit them all in the summer.